Thank you so much, uh, David and Dumi. Yes, uh, beside me, I do have uh, the CEO of NetBank, uh, Mike Brown. We perhaps will start off by getting an idea of whether WEF 2015 has lived up to, ex ex to his expectations as uh, the week's conversations begin to wrap up. Mike, uh, has WEF lived up to expectations this year? I think WEF always lives up to one's expectations. You know, it is just the most amazing grouping of people and minds in the world, going from business leaders to politicians to, to civil society. And I always find it an exercise in intellectual gymnastics, and I certainly enjoy that as a great way to start the year. No doubt you've been doing your stretching and a couple of leaps yourselves in that particular gymnastic arena. Let's talk about some of the conversations that you've been following. And as we begin to wrap up, what are you taking back home? I think, you know, one always tries to leave WEF with an understanding of what is the theme of these conversations. And certainly for me this year, there's, there's a lot of theme around uncertainty and nervousness around many things that are happening in the world. Things that stretch from what we're seeing uh, on the ge geopolitical front, um, what we're seeing in terms of monetary policy. Obviously, we've had two days of the build up to the ECB QE announcement that happened yesterday. And then with what we see happening from a technological advancement point of view and where the commodity prices are, quite a big theme around the fear of deflation. Mm. Let's take two of those uh, particular themes and just get a sense of how they impact on business for NetBank. And let's start off with uh, that ECB announcement. We saw massive reaction immediately in terms of uh, the drop in the euro and global market reaction. But let's talk long term implications. How do you then uh, make sense of this for your own business model? So I think, I think to make sense of, of QE over the longer term, nobody really knows yet exactly what the longer term implications are going to be. But certainly in the shorter term, um, what QE is likely to do is keep European interest rates lower for longer. That probably means uh, that global interest rates will be lower for longer. And in South Africa, that's beneficial for our consumers if our interest rates remain lower for longer. Mm. And uh, the technological aspects, we've seen uh, a great convergence between the banking space and telecommunications over the last few years. What's next? Um, in particular, because we know about mobile banking now, but it seems as if these kind of conversations will always try to tap into what happens next. So I think there'll be a number of things that'll, that'll happen next. A lot of them really need to be propelled by greater access to broadband. But I think what you'll see is mobile commerce or, or, or mobile banking, which at the moment is more internet banking and payments, becoming much more tightly integrated with mobile commerce, mm. enabling people to much more easily and, and simply use their phones as both a banking mechanism, yeah. a payment mechanism, and a choice of goods and services mechanism. Mm. And of course, we, there is a very interesting stat that I've picked up that says more people in Africa have access to a mobile phone than clean drinking water, which is worrisome in itself. But given that, do you get a sense that the banking sector is taking full advantage of what uh, this high mobile penetration across the continent could actually deliver, especially in the context of financial inclusion? I, I think the banking sector is absolutely taking context of it. Um, you know, certainly in our business, we've invested a lot of money in our internet banking solutions and in our banking app solution. Uh, our, our bank won the best consumer app in South Africa two years ago for our banking app. But I think what you really need to see happen over time is a, a much more integrated uh, application technology across the banks. It's a bit like uh, ATM cards. Right. You may remember 20 years ago, if you had an Edbank ATM card, you couldn't put it in the standard bank machine and vice versa. Then we got interchange between yeah. the banks. I think at some point in time, particularly in mobile money, there'll yeah. be some form of interchange that will make all the different mobile money loops talk to each other. Right. If there is to be that degree of interconnectivity, do we need a policy lever of sorts to enable it? Uh, and also, do we need some sort of shift in the regulatory environment so that such developments can thrive? I think all of these things, particularly in a banking world, given the importance of know your client um, and given the importance of anti-money laundering, all need to be enabled by a policy, a policy framework. And that's incredibly complicated to do, particularly when it needs to be one that transcends borders. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the African competition. Just yesterday I was speaking to the CEO of UBA uh, and he was letting us know that the bank is coming down to Angola, down to South Africa. And he seems to be quite keen to bring the fight to the big four. Uh, how's the competitive environment? How would you describe it right now? 
Uh, certainly the South African banking in, in, environment has always been incredibly competitive, but it's something that we welcome. To have good, strong competitors is energizing for your own business. Mm -hmm. So we would welcome competitors coming into our market. I think they'll find it quite a tough market to enter, mm -hmm. and I wouldn't be surprised if what they're really focusing on is trade flows between Nigeria and South Africa mm -hmm. and their customers doing business in South Africa. And let's just get your overall exp um, uh, in reflections on the African agenda. When we first started uh, on day one, we had a lot of uh, voices saying that maybe Africa and emerging markets have been knocked off the pedestal. Uh, did you get a sense that uh, African issues were still top of mind uh, in the conversations that transpired in the last few days? So I think all of these things have ebbs and flows and, and definitely what you, what you hear talking to people is over the longer term people still enormously bullish about the prospects of Africa, the growth rates in Africa compared to the growth rates in the west of the world. But I guess given some of the geopolitical challenges right now, given what's going on in Russia, given where the oil price is and given quantitative easing, mm. in the short term those have probably been more front of mind than the longer term African agenda. Mm. Yesterday, again, speaking to the IFC, one of the key things that came out of that conversation was that uh, investors are looking for more palatable risks in Africa, and perhaps we are moving in the right direction. But let's get a sense from you. Do you get a sense that uh, risks have become more palatable and that investors are overlooking Ebola, overlooking terrorism and saying there is still a high return to be had in the African markets? I think investors definitely look at, at Africa as an opportunity for growth. Um, I do think that the longer term investors do look through things like, like Ebola. Um, they may affect capital flows in, in the short term. But certainly, again, if one looks at the threat of deflation around the world, mm -hmm. the impact of quantitative easing, all that's doing is driving down yields in developed markets. Mm -hmm. And African yields are still quite attractive. Mm -hmm. So I certainly think we will continue to see flows into our continent. Now, we've seen an increase in activity here on the roof as uh, the conversations begin to wrap up. Everybody's trying to get their last sound bites and their last uh, uh, interviews in. What are you going to be doing before you get back onto the flight back to SA? So I think one of the first things I'm going to be doing is getting out of this interview in the snow because it's the first time I've ever been interviewed while it's snowing. Now I've got a number of, of bilateral meetings that I need to have during the course of, of today. Um, I generally attend most of the sessions tomorrow morning and then with a bit of luck I might manage to get to the slopes tomorrow afternoon. Mike, thank you so much for making the time to join us. And uh, there you have it, uh, David and Dumi, uh, Mike Brown, CEO of NetBank, talking everything from uh, his uh, reflections on WEF to the banking competition in South Africa. And it sounds like to me he's saying to uh, the CEO of UBA, bring on the fight, we're ready. That's right, Nazi. Well, tell us a little bit also about what's dominating the conversation there. I think it's been quite unusual in that there's been a major European Central Bank announcement at the same time as uh, the WEF. So that must be a topic of conversation. What's the buzz there at the moment? Absolutely, David, and, uh, and you'd be interested in knowing that uh, a lot of the participants are actually shying away from having making any commentary around the immediate or short-term impacts of this particular decision. Everybody's more keen to speak about the long-term effects. Uh, just yesterday, I was speaking to the chief economist uh, at the world for the World Economic Forum, uh, uh, Margrethe, and she was very clear that uh, this is a decision they've been watching closely, but more looking at the long-term impacts. Uh, the, the other part of the conversation of course is that uh, is whether Mario, uh, Mario Draghi was able to sufficiently weigh uh, the pros and cons of this decision. Remember that there is that possible backlash from Germany. It certainly seems that uh, the backlash from Germany uh, isn't as important as taking this uh, really, really big step in terms of monetary policy for the ECB. But on the South African front, I must say that I didn't have to work hard uh, to get the South Africans to speak about ESCOM or the National Development Plan or the infrastructure structure plans we have for the country, it seemed as if every single delegate uh, that I spoke to from the South African context was at pains to uh, be the ones to say, look, we understand that we have an energy crisis in the country and we're working on it. And I think, David, that must be the official South African message that's been brought to the World Economic Forum. And to quote uh, the, uh, the governor yesterday, South Africa is not free of blemishes, but we are certainly uh, working on getting our house in order. 
Nozi, what has been the uh, investor message when it comes to investment on the African continent? Um, just drawing on the debate that took place earlier on in the week, uh, African businesses and people outside of Africa are still investing on the continent despite the fact that we have seen uh, pockets of terror attacks and uh, also the Ebola epidemic. What's the rest of the investor community saying? Great question, Dumi. Uh, absolutely, investors are saying that they take cognizance uh, of uh, the blip, and I think that's the word that's actually come up quite often, the blip that we've had in the African growth story in the form of Ebola and uh, the terror attacks that we've seen in the west uh, of the continent. But they still are acknowledging that Africa is indeed opening, open for business. They are acknowledging uh, the regulatory reforms that the, 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 the most of the markets have gone through and the good governance that is sweeping through the continent and they're certainly saying that uh, despite, the, despite these developments, uh, Africa is still a market that is attractive for investment. Um, there was, of course, uh, a concern about uh, the absence uh, of the Nigerian delegation. Uh, and absence, I mean thinner delegation than we've had in the previous years. Um, I did speak, though, to the CEO of the Nigerian Stock Exchange. I also spoke uh, to Tony Elemelu and many other Nigerians who are here. And they all say that, let's not forget that there is an election coming up and that maybe uh, for the, the, the public uh, service, the focus right now is on those elections. But the World Economic Forum continues to be a very important platform for Nigeria uh, and that they also recognize that the issues that are relevant uh, not only to that particular country but the continent at large are still top of mind. Yesterday speaking to Elsie Kanza, she is of course responsible for uh, the World Economic Forum in Africa. Uh, she, made, she made sure to remind us that there is WEF Africa coming up in June 2015 and this was yet another platform to once again put African issues and African investment opportunities in particular back in the spotlight.